Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Sayek, and today I'm going to be presenting on cash oblivious algorithms. Algorithms that are asymptotically optimal with respect to the number of cash misses without needing to know any parameters of the cash. So before we get into it, I'm going to discuss a bit about what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'll summarize a bit of the memory hierarchy that you may be familiar with from your computer architecture course. Uh, while also talking about the idealized memory model we're going to be using to analyze these cache algorithms. We'll talk about cache-naive programming, programming without any thinking about the cache, no parameters, um, no, not even considering it. Um, we'll talk about cache-aware programming, where we do know parameters of the cache, uh, and then finally move on to the topic of this talk, cache-oblivious algorithms, and how we can you know, use this cache uh, without knowing any parameters of it. I'll demonstrate the principles um, that we use to design cache oblivious algorithms um, by way of example on square matrix transpose and multiplication. And then we'll look at some performance analysis of how square matrix multiplication actually performs against the naive non-cache aware implementation. The idealized cache model uh, and, computer models more and computers more generally consist of a CPU, some number of layers of cache and main memory. Main memory is RAM, uh, and there are several, usually several layers of cache of increasing size um, between the computer processor and memory. In the idealized model, uh, we have an L1 cache only and a main memory, so a two-level memory hierarchy system. The cache serves the function of absorbing um, high-cost memory accesses uh, and storing our results so that we can use them again. As for how we're going to model the L1 cache uh, in this um, model, uh, we're going to define the cache as two parameters, Z and L. Z is the size of the cache in words, and L is the number of words per cache line. So in this example cache here, um, we have uh, L different words in the cache line, uh, and Z over L different cache lines, the size of the cache divided by the number of words per cache line. Some other notable features of the cache uh, is that it has order one lookup, you can find out whether or not a memory address is in the cache in order one time. Full associativity, when, the cache, uh, when you bring in an entry into the cache, uh, you can put it anywhere within the cache. And optimal replacement, when you need to remove something from the cache, you pick the uh, entry that won't be accessed for the longest period of time in future. Real caches, especially the L1, might not have completely full associativity or op and especially don't use optimal replacement. Um, this model does generalize um, uh, in practice. For this talk, we'll be using uh, the least recently used policy for cache replacement in place of optimal replacement for analyzing cache misses, as the two of the optimal replacement and the least recently used policy are asymptotically, uh, asymptotically equivalent under certain conditions which will be true in the algorithms looked at. This model um, of a two-level system also does mathematically generalize to multi-level caches. So before we get into cache-aware and cache-oblivious programming, uh, let's look at cache-naive programming for the square matrix transpose. Let's say we have a matrix B that we want to transfer, a transpose, and store into a matrix A. When we go to access, when we do the traditional transposing system, we'll look at the columns of the matrix B and store them in matrix A. However, uh, if we store the matrix in row major order, which means we represent the rows contiguously um, and not the columns, we'll be striding against the cache line. Elements one, two, and three will be in different cache lines, and we may miss uh, a large number of times and evict past entries that we need before going to the next column. If you iterate in row-centric uh, format, so over one, four, seven, you'll have the same problem, but for the other um, matrix. This is um, a big problem to stride against the cache line, as you may evict entries you'll need in future um, due to your cache being full way too quickly. And, this, and you'll have to bring in the same cache line multiple times. Let's take a look at how this might actually, um, an example of where this actually goes wrong. Here we've got the two matrices A and B that we want to, tr that we want to transpose B into A. Uh, they are stored in row major format, so you can see that the arrays um, in matrix stored as, as a bunch of arrays for each row. Um, and we have a simple cache that can store eight total elements and two elements per cache line, so four total cache lines. 
um, since it's uh, two items per cache line uh, and it's stored in row major, we store the first, we store elements two um, by two, uh, two elements at a time um, sorted by row. Okay, so let's take a look at what will actually happen when we go to access it. In the first loop of the array, we're gonna bring in element A and assign element one to it. Next, we'll take element B and assign element two in it. In all these cases, we'll bring in the relevant cache lines that contain the elements we want to use. Incidentally, we'll bring along elements five and six because they reside in the same cache lines. After this, we'll bring in C since we want to assign to it. And as we're no, we have no more need for A and B, we'll replace it with three and seven. So we need to assign three to C. However, we run into a problem um, when we try to bring in four. The cache line containing four um, doesn't have an obvious place to put it. We do need the cache line containing D because we're writing to it this cycle, but removing, all, removing any of the other cache lines will cause a guaranteed miss in future cycles. Five, six, and seven all need to be written to E, F, and G in the immediate following iteration. This is a result of bad cache line usage. If we look at how we're iterating over matrix B, we'll see that we're accessing one, two, three, and four all in different cache lines. If we look at the actual number of misses we're gonna endure asymptotically, um, inside of this inner for loop, um, this one here, um, we're going to endure order n cache misses at every iteration. When we iterate through B, we may fully clear out the cache of all other useful information that we've brought in due to limited size. As we have an order n loop for n by n matrices, we have an order n loop here and an order n loop here, this gives us um, a total of n squared cache misses for our, um, in this naive case. But we can do better. Treating L, the number of elements in a cache line, um, as a variable, we see that we can actually lower bound the problem by order n squared over L. The, the amount of cache lines in each matrix of an n by n matrix is n squared over L, um, and the cost to load each matrix, matrix's cache lines exactly once, or even a constant number of times, is order n squared over L. And that is the problem's lower bound um, for the number of cache misses. Let's now look at cache-aware programming and how we can do better than cache-naive programming in terms of the number of cache misses. In cache-aware programming, we can use the cache parameters Z and L in our programs to help improve performance and reduce cache misses. Something you may have seen in computer architecture is loop blocking, where you iterate through the array, not by complete rows or by complete columns, but by smaller blocks. As our, block, as our um, cache has cache line size of two elements, we use two by two blocks, so block being equal to L, and bring things in accordingly. In this case, we go A, B, E, F, instead of A, B, C, D, and here we go one, two, five, six. If we look at how this is being used, we'll bring in A and B and one and five as before, and we'll bring in two and six again, since we want to assign one and two to A and B. But notice now we bring in E and F. And because we brought in E and F, we can now use the data we already have in the cache. Five and six can be assigned to E and F, and when we go to the next cycle, we'll have fully utilized all the information within our cache, and we can simply remove all entries. Um, when we look at the number of cache misses that we have, um, since we are fully utilizing each cache line, never needing to bring it in for a second time, um, we need to only read the matrices once each only. This means we have definitely got the lower bound of order n squared over L cache misses. Cache aware programming um, is quite useful, but there's one problem with it, and that's generalization. Um, a MacBook computer, an old Windows computer, or indeed server farms at Google or any other big um, organization may have computers across a variety of different specifications. Having our library routines for common operations like transpose and multiplication working well um, and efficiently across a variety of computers is important. And this is the motivation for cache oblivious programming. Cache oblivious programming is algorithms that are asymptotically optimal with respect to the number of cache misses without needing to know um, the cache parameters at all. But before we get into some example algorithms, let's more formally define how we're gonna look at cache misses. I'm going to define Q, taking in parameters N, Z, and L as giving the number of cache misses um, as a property of an algorithm. 
It takes in Z and L, the parameters of the cache, and N, the problem that we are working on, a problem of size N. For sorting, N might be the size of the array. For matrix multiplication, we might have an N squared size matrix um, for square matrices of size N by N. As an example, all Q is is a function, so we might have N over L times Z squared. It's just a function uh, of, vari of variables N, Z, and L. All right, before we go into the cache oblivious algorithms, it's also important to keep in mind um, the design principles that are going into these. These, these uh, algorithms that I'm gonna show are cool, but they really exemplify the principles behind how you can design cache oblivious algorithms that are efficient or indeed optimal. The common themes are divide and conquer, where you split it into independent subproblems, uh, and recursive data structures that match the logical structure of the algorithm you're using them for. All right, without further ado, let's look at square matrix transposition for cache oblivious algorithms. The problem, as we've seen, is to take a matrix X, transpose it, and store it in another matrix Y. The naive implementation has order N squared um, misses as the column axes stride against the cache line. So our goal, looking back at where we succeeded in cache-aware programming, is to take the subproblems that make up our larger problem, in the case of cache-aware programming, this was two by two blocks, and having them fit into the cache so we can use them more efficiently. As it turns out, there's an identity from linear algebra that can help us here. Um, if we take a matrix and transpose it, we can represent it as, as a matrix built up of transposes of smaller matrices. For a matrix A, B, C, and D, we can break it into four smaller matrices, A, B, C, and D. These are not integers themselves, but represent um, sub-matrices of a larger problem. For a four by four matrix, A, B, C, and D might be two by two matrices, the corners of the matrix. All right, now we'll look at the implementation strategy for how we might implement them. For a base case, so some very small size of matrix, so for example, a two by two matrix, we can use the cache naive implementation we looked at at the very beginning of the talk and apply that to the source and destination matrices. For an inductive step, um, oh yeah, uh, and this, uh, the smallest case will definitely fit into the cache. Um, it's small enough that pretty much on any system it will. There's an asterisk there. If your data structures representing integers are particularly large, they will not fit into the cache. As for transposes, um, when we want to define the inductive step, we look at the top left corner of the results matrix we want to make uh, and put the transpose of the top left corner of the source matrix. The same for the bottom right and same for the other two edges of the matrix. We recurse down applying a transpose on a much larger matrix to the smaller independent subproblems which can be computed um, without need to know of each other's cache usage. Um, but there's one, sub, one edge case you may have thought of that I haven't mentioned yet, and that's if n is odd. If n is odd, we can't break it into four even corners. Uh, as to do so, we need to define, divide n by two to create two n by two, or sorry, four n by two um, times n by two matrices. There are two different ways that we can deal with odd n, and so I'll go through um, them both here. Um, the first, uh, the first is we could chop off a row and a column rather than dealing with, uh, rather than having to deal with them uh, within the subproblems, we deal with them on the layer that recurses down. We chop off a row and column and pass that two by two subcase, in this case, down to lower layers to deal with. In a bigger matrix, such as a five by five, we'd ha break it into a four by four matrix, take each of those corners and recurse down into subcases. Then after we'd recursed down, we would manually swap um, all of the uh, elements. So we'd swap three with seven, eight with six on the rows that, and column that we had chopped off. There is a problem here, and that's that we have basically the same problem with the naive implementation. We might, um, if this is a row major matrix, we'll stride against the cache line when we go down the column. So we'll ensure order n cache misses at every layer that we go down. But if we, represent it in column major will suffer when we try to go across the rows. So is there something we can do to have better asymptotic misses? Um, it turns out there is. 
To avoid having to endure those extra order n matrices, order n misses in the cache, um, we can use a hyperceiling matrix, which just means we find the smallest power of two greater than n for our n by n matrix and pad out our matrix to be um, that size. So in this case, we have a three by three matrix that we can pad out to be the smallest power of two above a four by four. For a five by five matrix, the next highest power of two would be eight. This doesn't add any extra, um, this doesn't uh, break the correctness of our algorithm. All we'd be doing in the worst case is swapping these zeros around. But what it means is that we can always cleanly divide it down by half in the, in the length and the width all the way down to our base cases. Do we endure any extra asymptotic work? Well, the most we can grow n is by a factor of two. So the greatest we could grow it is 2n by 2n, um, which is 4n squared and four times as many misses to bring in the array, or to bring in the matrix. And that's a constant factor, order of one. Looking at the number of cache misses um, as a function of the number of elements in the matrix n squared. In the case where two times a matrix's size is greater than the cache, we have both a source and a destination matrix um, that we need to consider, both of size n by n. So when we can't fit both of them in the cache, we may endure cache misses. Um, looking at, we'll have to recurse down into four subproblems, a to the t, c to the t, b to the t, and d to the t, all of size n squared over four, which gives us this term of four times q of n squared over four. And also some constant work that may, that may happen with cache misses. However, if we can fit both matrices for the source and destination of the problem we're trying to compute into the cache in their entirety, we only endure the cost to bring in both matrices exactly once. As we've seen before, the cost to bring in uh, both matrices is n squared over L, the number of cache lines that the matrix represents for its total data. Solving this recurrence relation um, yields order n squared over L, the optimal time. Uh, the optimal, sorry, the optimal cache misses um, for the algorithm. Um, this is trivially the lower bound as we've seen. It's a within a constant factor of just the time, the, just the number of cache misses it would take to load the two matrices by themselves. Let's take the principles we've learned from matrix transposition and take them to a bigger, more complex problem, multiplication. To get an idea of what we're trying to improve upon, let's take a look at the cache naive way you might implement matrix multiplication. As an order n cubed time operation, you have two for loops in blue and in red to iterate over the rows and columns of the matrix that you're trying to compute. You have a C matrix that you're writing a multiplication to and two matrices A and B that you're multiplying. In the inner for loop, we iterate over the row of one matrix and the column of the other. Again, assuming row major matrices, um, we'll end up striding against the cache line and enduring a lot of cache misses. In this inner for loop, for the same reason we had with matrix transposition, we'll endure order n cache misses um, because we may fully clear our cache before we get to the next um, iteration. These or other two higher um, loops uh, have order n squared time. Both of them iterate over order n, yielding a total cache miss complexity of order n cubed misses. Now let's look at how we might do this with a cache oblivious um, approach. So given two matrices, we want to find their product and store it in a third matrix C. The naive implementation as we've seen has order n cubed misses because for each cell we might need um, for every multiplication for each cell, we might need to pull in a range of different cache blocks which might wipe the cache. And so our goal learning from matrix transposition is to split it into smaller subproblems and divide and conquer on these subproblems. We can use the extended matrix approach that we've seen before to avoid odd cases. Like before, we have an important observation we can use. You may have seen before the standard formula um, for two by two matrix multiplication. This should look fairly familiar, um, but we can use the um, idea from matrix transposition where we break the matrix into four sub-matrices. Here, A1, 1, A1, 2, A2, 1, etc. are not integers, they are sub-matrices. 
And this yields four independent matrix multiplications from one matrix multiplication that we were trying to complete. Though these have a plus tying them together, they can be added to matrix C in any order without, without needing to know of each other. So let's look at how we're going to implement it. Again, for some base case, you know, perhaps a two by two matrix, we'll use the regular cache naive implementation um, to multiply A and B and store them in C. And then for the inductive step like before, we'll recurse down into the multiplications for each of the four cells. Here we have the top left of A and the top left of B being added into the top left of C. Uh, this is this multiplication here. And then we have the other pair being multiplied out here. Looking at the number of cache misses to save a lengthy derivation, um, it ends up working out to be n cubed over L root to Z, um, a significant improvement over order n cubed. But this isn't quite matching the trivial lower bound. Like with matrix transposition, um, we, can lower, we can load uh, all the matrices exactly once in order n squared over L time. Um, we must fully read the matrices to perform matrix multiplication. So the minimum lower bound is this value here. But it's not actually known whether what the exact tight lower bound on matrix multiplication in terms of cache misses is. Um, just like we don't know if we can do matrix multiplication in order n squared time, we don't know if we can do it in the number of cache misses of order n squared over L. One last thing to keep in mind, one last idea to keep in mind for cache um, oblivious algorithms is the idea of recursive data structures. When we're performing multiplication and transposition, um, we're accessing into the four corners of the matrix. But our matrix isn't really built to access blocks, subproblems like this. The, the subproblem of one, two, five, and six for two by two matrix, the base case of both of the algorithms I've presented, have one, two, five, and six in different cache lines. And it requires two cache loads bringing in unnecessary information to solve the particular subproblem. Three, four, seven, and eight are in different cache lines and are not needed um, for this particular base case. A better, more logical approach is to change the structure of the cache lines so that they hold one, two, five, and six together, three, four, seven, and eight together, et cetera. Representing a, um, and this means that the entirety of the base case fits into one cache line and we have full utilization of all cache lines we bring in. Looking at the corner matrix, if we were to represent it as a one dimensional array, it would look something like this in the, in the approach where we have um, better grouping of cache lines. We have one, two, five, and six at the start of the array. They'll be grouped together in the cache along with three, four, seven, and eight, nine, 10, 13, and 14, et cetera. How would you actually go about implementing this? Well, for an array with four subsections, um, if it's a two by two matrix, we just put those elements contiguously in memory. But if, we, if it is greater than the two by two matrix, a four by four matrix, et cetera, we can recurse down into those um, sub parts as we've done before, unpack them so that they're contiguously allocated in memory, um, and uh, we'll have the desired ma uh, matrix at the end with the sub problems logically grouped in how we're accessing them. We've built our data structure so that it matches the logical structure that we're using to access elements in the problem. Looking at how the naive versus cache oblivious algorithms perform, uh, on the x-axis, we have the input matrix size, uh, and on the y-axis, we have the time to compute. For, very, for larger matrices, as might be used, for example, in more scientific computations, the, array, the um, cache oblivious algorithm significantly outperforms the naive approach. At the very top end there, we have 25 minutes for that cache oblivious algorithm computation versus 40 minutes for the naive approach. But divide and conquer, the principle we've been using to analyze these three different approaches to improving on how our algorithm performs isn't perfect. A classic divide and conquer algorithm is merge sort. We divide an N array into two smaller arrays of size N over two. You can lower bound the amount of cache misses in merge sort by N over L times log N over Z. But because those subproblems aren't perfectly independent, this is actually not completely optimal. Another sorting algorithm that is cache oblivious, funnel sort divides an array into a cube root of n smaller arrays of size cube root n squared and outperforms it in uh, merge sort in terms of cache misses by a factor of log of z. 
With all that in mind, the key takeaways that you can use when building cache oblivious algorithms um, and even algorithms more generally is that the cache does matter. It takes time to do stuff with space, and if you're bringing stuff into the cache, you may as well use it. You can use divide and conquer. Uh, you can break your problem into smaller independent sub-problems that will fit in your cache and will allow you to um, make full utilization of what you bring in. Accessing memory is expensive, and it can take up to 200 times as long. You'd much rather have something that you can reuse. And finally, recursive data structures. When you're building a data structure, or indeed using a data structure for an algorithm, you'd much rather have it um, match the logical structure in which it's going to be accessed to make good use of the spatial locality that your system provides. Um, thank you very much for listening, uh, and special thanks to Dr. Sam Ainsworth for mentoring this talk. Uh, these are my academic references, and here are the references for some of the images you may have seen on screen. Thank you. Thank you.